Well, holy smokes, Nvidia knocked it out of the park with earnings, implying maybe artificial intelligence isn't a flash in the pan. Maybe just because people aren't necessarily incorporating AI into everything they're doing in their lives yet, doesn't necessarily mean that companies, especially big CSPs, also known as cloud service providers, aren't throwing every bit of coal they have into the furnace of artificial intelligence. I think that is a sign that AI has massive staying power, even if it's just starting to come to consumers. In other words, even if consumers might not wake up every day and say, I want AI, the companies that know to use AI are the cloud service providers and all the software companies built on top of that layer. In other words, your Amazon, your Meta, Facebook, your Google, and your Microsoft are going to plow money into AI data centers. So that way other software companies like Snowflake or maybe Palantir or whatever can make more data-based uh, and provide more data-based insights and conclusions to their customers and therefore sell more software, whether that's in cybersecurity, business analytics, whatever. Point is, you don't have to rely on normal people walking down the street going, oh yeah, I use GPT all day long. Who cares? Oh, what, maybe 50% of people have actually heard about it when surveyed in the United States, maybe 20% have actually tried it, and maybe half of those 20% actually end up using it every single day. So I bet the actual AI use of people is probably only somewhere around like one in 10 people actually using AI practically on a daily basis now. But it's the cloud service providers that know this is the next frontier. Why not advertise these things that you told us here? I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take. And this is what's motivated Jensen to say, which he said in the last earnings call as well. We made a video about how this could happen and that this could double down, that the cloud service providers are going to make the investment and whether or not the software actually works, they're betting on it and the chips will sell. Well, that's what's happening. But what's worth noting is Jensen mentioned these cloud service providers right now are spending about $250 billion every single year on capital expenditures for data centers. And he expects a large portion of that to shift over to generative AI and accelerate compute. And this is basically what NVIDIA is providing chips for. And so that is what brings us to this incredible beat. And we're going to go through the numbers, but we'll also do some uh, brief projections here uh, to get into, uh, you know, is, is this all just hype or is this real? And the reality is when a company can offer $3 billion in buybacks in just the last three months, they got some money, but it's not just $3 billion in buybacks over the last three months or $1.2 billion in debt pay down. It's that they just authorized another $25 billion in buybacks because their cash flow is huge. $6 billion of free cash flow in six months. That works out to $24 billion of free cash flow per year. Now, this is now a trillion dollar company by market cap. They're paying out close to a billion dollars or around $32,000 per three months on average to their employees in stock-based compensation. It's also worth noting they've got about 16 bill in cash, but again, that's growing by about $6 billion every three months. Crazy. They've got total debt uh, sitting at about $20 billion when you factor out their leases, which means they can basically pay off all their debt and pay out massive buybacks, which is great. That is the tax effective way to get dividends basically, right? Because with buybacks, you push the stock up, people can choose to sell the stock if they want and choose to pay the taxes rather than being forced to pay the taxes. We actually look at the numbers. I want you to pay specific attention to the R&D numbers and the growth numbers of the ex expenses. Uh, in fact, if we jump on over, I wanna say I wrote the notes down a little bit. Uh, uh, whatever, we'll just look at them here. Uh, the point is the R&D numbers aren't actually moving that much based on their growth. Look at their growth. You 2X uh, revenue growth over the last three months, year over year. 
you grew them 38% with the last six months compared to the last six months prior, meaning a lot of that growth is happening likely in the last three months. So you massively are exploding revenues. But what are you doing in terms of R&D and sales? You're barely growing them. Sales barely moved up. I mean, that's about a 5% move in sales here while they doubled their revenues on a six month period, 38% and only a 5% move in sales. That's because these Nvidia chips are set and systems are selling themselves. Their R&D, folks, they already developed it. Now you just start working on next generation. So it's not like they're having to blow up their R&D expenses. They pop them up less than 10% here. Call it about 10% to make math, just simple rounded numbers here. So you're barely moving sales. You're barely moving R&D, but you're milking tendies. Your margin is going up. Uh, your margin actually moved up in the last quarter uh, compared to your last six months from about 68.1% gross profit to 70%. So you're actually making more money as you're selling more. Keep in mind, they've got insane profit. These H100s are expected to have a profit margin, you know, expected to cost like $3,000. But because there's such little supply, they're basically selling them for like twenty-five to $30,000, a potential 1,000% markup. And some folks are like, hey, isn't that at some point going to compress uh, margins? And the idea here is not necessarily, because if a small portion of your revenue right now is H100s, you're selling at 1,000% profit, maybe 800% margin, uh, whatever, profit margin, whatever. Eventually, as you move to that being a larger percentage and you get more in line with selling it for maybe like a 2x profit, right? Uh, or a 70% gross profit. That's okay because you're growing the quantity you're able to supply. And in the earnings call, we heard, hey, they are ramping as much as they can and working with their suppliers on ramping to get these chips out the door as fast as possible. They said they're happy with the suppliers, but let's be clear, they said they expect to be ramping through 2024. So we're still in an 18 month ramp cycle for these chips and actually being able to manufacture enough of these chips. They just can't get enough of them out the door. This is important. This is a very, very big indication uh, that uh, Nvidia has massive, massive pricing power. Uh, and remember, it's not consumers buying this stuff. It's the Microsofts, the Meta, the Amazon, the Google. You know, you could break down chip data all day long. The point is, they told us on their earnings call, 50% of their customers are cloud service providers. That's, that's where 50% of their data center revenue is coming from, cloud service providers. After that, you're looking at about, I think it was, uh, let me see here, I'll, I'll give you the exact numbers to confirm. So 50% was cloud service providers. The next was a consumer internet at about 25% and then enterprise. It's worth noting, enterprise was actually still towards the end. It was So it's not actually yet enterprise that's providing most of the revenue for NVIDIA. But then again, most of the enterprise customers are gonna go to like a VMware and go, look, we don't understand this whole AI stuff. We're not gonna buy NVIDIA chips. We just wanna like, like just give us the product. Well, NVIDIA just partnered with VMware to provide the part product. So then VMware and the other cloud service providers can invest even more in chips. Uh, it, it's absolutely incredible. So uh, anywho, let's keep going here. So uh, this is a big deal. Okay, uh, what else do we see here? So this is the income statement. We saw the balance sheet. We saw the cash flow statement. Worth noting how much of a beat this was. You beat data center revenue by 29%. You were expecting $7.98 billion. It actually came in at $10.32 billion. Uh, Jensen says this is a new era of cloud compute. It's the same thing he said last time, except they're reiterating their staying power, saying here, look, our CUDA software stack has a moat. You want to be with NVIDIA. And as a result, they're actually not having to market more. That's the thing. They're not having to market more. Everybody's going to NVIDIA without them having to advertise more. That just increases their margin. They're the you know hot commodity on the block and everybody wants them right now. That is pricing power. In the NVIDIA H100s and the associated uh, you know, HGX platforms and otherwise, they are the iPhone of artificial intelligence. And anybody who's anybody in, in software is, is making sure that they have the competitive edge. And so they're investing and as a result, they're mostly buying NVIDIA chips. 
the fact that gaming grew was a surprise. I'm actually, I've got uh, the RTX 4080 uh, and 90 in this office right here in the studio. Uh, and I think they're great chips. And uh, that segment actually grew again, beat expectations and grew. The segment that failed for NVIDIA uh, to beat expectations was automotive, driven by weak automotive demand in China. Not a surprise since China is really expected to be going through uh, probably a depression. Not fantastic for a company like Tesla selling cars in China, but then again, Giga Shanghai is really turning into the export market, so manufacturing these vehicles in China and then shipping them around the world. Think about some of the moats that NVIDIA has. CUDA, free marketing, and they're the ones everybody talk, uh, talks about when you want the latest and the best product. It's kind of interesting. It's hard to find something bad here, especially when you've even got companies like Oracle going all in for these, and Jensen uh, and their CFO suggest there is, quote, tremendous demand uh, for these products. Now, who knows, maybe they're just, you know, saying it, but let's just say they just said it in the last earnings call and they proved it in this earnings report. So you're kind of on a trajectory of believability here, especially when Facebook says when they apply AI-based recommendations, they actually increase the time people spend on Facebook or Instagram by about 24%. So generative AI and Accelerate Compute already affecting how much time people are spending all attached to things like Instagram or YouTube or whatever. As a result, leading Facebook to want to spend even more money on, on these front of, uh, uh, you know, what do they call them? Front of, front of app, uh, a family of apps, FOA, family of apps uh, software suites. So it's just gonna be your Facebook.com, your Instagram threads and otherwise. And Facebook, I read through the earnings report this morning with course members, and they say they spend 80% of their CapEx on their apps, not on Reality Labs. Reality Labs is only 20%. That means they're spending on data center, AI for Lattice, advertising data centers. That's where the money's going. And they're calling up NVIDIA to buy chips, no doubt. Uh, Shutterstock involved with them as well for generative AI, blah, blah, blah. The U.S. is the strongest sector for uh, this growth, although uh, China, uh, China's AI demand also sitting about 20 to 25%. So China automotive suffering, but China AI doesn't want to stay behind. This is because we might be in not a, an enterprise recession, but a consumer recession where the consumer suffers or many consumers suffer and can't spend that much on places like Target or Cheesecake or Walmart or Nike or Under Armour or Lulu or whatever. But the enterprise companies, Google and Microsoft and Amazon and Apple, these are the companies that have money to spend and they spend billions of dollars. They're not feeling the recession. The people are feeling the recession, but not the big companies. And so who are the big co companies buying from? NVIDIA, whether it's for those cloud compute uh, uh, products, whether it's for InfiniBand, which is basically their version of Ethernet for data centers. Think about it as cabling infrastructure, network switches, uh, you know, server racks. It's actually connecting all of the hardware together using InfiniBand. Duck, um, uh, uh, Jensen mentioned, founder and CEO of NVIDIA, mentioned numerous times in the last earnings call, reiterated again in this time, that InfiniBand basically sells itself because once you apply it, your cost of running a data center plummets. And we're sitting at a trillion dollar legacy data center uh, environment. And we are just at the beginning of a transition to cloud compute uh, uh, via accelerated compute and generative AI. Uh, and so this is, this is not a matter of being a consumer flash in the pan or not. This is an enterprise movement into generative AI and cloud compute. As a result, all of the cloud service providers, the CSPs are like, we better be ready for all that demand. If we build it, they will come, so to speak. And because if we don't build it, the other CSP will. So in other words, like Microsoft's like, well, if we don't build the data center, Amazon will do it and they'll take our customers, right? So the they, uh, same thing with Google and otherwise. So this is actually very interesting. Uh, regarding the sustainability of demand, there was a question about this. And they, they spoke about on their earnings call about uh, they're going to be ramping well into next year. And obviously they need a lot of parts, but they see uh, this, this as a long-term industry and sustainably long-term uh, based transition. 
Uh, a lot of growth of various different verticals of the business, talked a lot about some of the individual chips, but they think they have excellent visibility into this year and next. And they're basically saying, demand ain't going away for the next two years. That's visibility they have for the next two years. Keep in mind, I don't think the big customers, the CSPs, are fickle like consumers, where they're like, hey, we want all the AI stuff, and then they go in and cancel orders. I think the, you know, Google or whatever, uh, the Googles of the world are kind of like, please, Microsoft, cancel so we can get more. You know, this is literally like, hell no, why ain't canceling? Because then you're just going to take it. It's kind of brilliant when you think about it from an enterprise point of view. NVIDIA has just got to be on cloud nine right now. And this is great for the ARM IPO, though I think the ARM IPO will create a buy the dip opportunity for NVIDIA because people will shift some money over there. I think that'll be a mistake. Uh, I think the only reason you want to shift away from NVIDIA is if you want to diversify into like real estate or something like that. But that's just to, you know, minimize swings in your portfolios. Uh, but other than that, this this is absolutely fantastic. Now, uh, what what else did we learn? Well, we learned that uh, NVIDIA is, is, is expecting $250 million in data center spend per year. Okay, so uh, what is actually $250 billion in data center spend per year? Let me correct myself there. Uh, NVIDIA, in my opinion, uh, well, first of all, NVIDIA's total revenue uh, right now is somewhere around $40 billion for the year. Let me see. The current estimate is $44 billion for the year. Data center alone, I would not be surprised if NVIDIA could end up pulling in the future $100 million out of a full 250, sorry, 100 billion uh, of data center spend. That'd be about 40%. But let's go a little more generic, let's go a little more conservative, let's say, and go with 25% of a quarter billion dollars, uh, a quarter of a trillion dollars. I wrote this down wrong, that's why I keep saying it. Let me just change that to a B really quick, there we go. If NVIDIA captures just 25% of that 250 billion dollar per year spend, that's $62.5 billion of data center revenue. Right now, the data center revenue is uh, a big portion of NVIDIA's income, but that could represent over the next, uh, you know, year to two years, somewhere around a 50 to 75 to 50% growth rate for their top line earnings. And I think you'll probably end up averaging over the next few years as they continue to introduce next generation AI hardware, like the next generation H100, you're probably looking at a growth rate for this company that'll end up averaging over the next four years, closer to 35%. Wall Street right now is only pricing in 25% growth. So I'm not here to say, oh, it's gonna be 100% or 50% growth every single year for the next four years. But if you price in, just to show you the valuation of this, if you price NVIDIA at a 35% growth rate, take their stock price at say $510, divide it by, call it $9.50 of earnings to get you to the end of this year, their end of this year is January of 2024. That puts you at about 53.6 times earnings. Now what we're going to do is divide that to get a peg ratio by 35%. You're looking at uh, a 1.5 peg. That means NVIDIA is actually trading closer in valuation right now to Enphase than Tesla. Tesla is trading at a peg of about 2.3, sitting at about a 69 PE, call it 30% growth rate on earnings. That's about a 2.3 peg. That actually makes NVIDIA's valuation extremely attractive. Now let's go back to just being even more conservative. Say their EPS only grows at 25% the way Wall Street expects over the next four years on average, that puts them at a 2.1 peg, still cheaper than Tesla. Now, some people are wondering, is this potentially inflationary? No, this is actually deflationary. This is why companies are replacing more back office jobs because they can get more done with artificial intelligence. They can get more done with cloud compute and they need less people in back offices. So this is a deflationary force, even though it's more spend on the next generation technology. It's really incredible. So NVIDIA is phenomenally positioned here. And just with some very generic math, uh, the, the numbers for NVIDIA can be absolutely phenomenal here. Uh, again, understand data center revenue right now, 
sitting at 10.3 billion. Uh, rec uh, you know, total revenue at 13.5. So it's obviously very clear that data center revenue is already a bulk of their revenue. It already makes up about 76% of their revenue. But if, if we get to 25% of that $250 billion market in the future, uh, that's 62.5, and I expect that'll grow over time as well. Uh, and that just represents 76% because you've got gaming and automotive and these other segments as well. NVIDIA's revenue could be closer to $82 billion very quickly. Wall Street does not expect that NVIDIA's revenue is going to broach $80 billion until 2026. It'll actually probably happen in 2024 or five. So I think this growth is going to happen a lot faster and sooner uh, than expected. And it'll be growth for ASML. It'll be growth for TSM. It'll be growth for Intel, and it'll be growth for NVIDIA because this transition is not just going to be a one-time transition. It'll be, all right, we got the iPhone 1 in. Now, who's got the iPhone 2? Well, NVIDIA is already working on the iPhone 2. Well, the iPhone 3G is what the iPhone 2 is called, but you know what I mean. Anyway, this is incredibly bullish. Uh, now, we have to sort of temper expectations here because there is this potential for the stock market to try to price in too much of that growth, right? Uh, and we are still in a very uncertain macro environment. Uh, and the level of software revenues are still questionable from companies like, you know, soft, uh, Snowflake, Microsoft, and otherwise. But we did also just have Snowflake revenues and Autodesk revenues. And guess what? Both of them beat. So kind of impressive. I have to say there's little to be upset about about this. What I would do... Uh, and this is not personalized financial advice for you because I don't know your personalized financial situation, but I like the idea of, and this is what I'm personally going to do, I like the idea of allocating uh, money to stuff like uh, uh, NVIDIA, TSM, ASML, uh, Intel, Tesla, but I'm going to put in that basket solar. So that way, if these, these you know, uh, uh, Pick and shovel sellers do well and solar keeps sucking, that's okay. My portfolio is growing. But when solar booms and the chips start going like, okay, like we've had our run, that's when I expect the portfolio just keeps rocketing. And I think one of the nice ways to do that is, is through, you know, an ETF that, that focuses on, on a strategy like that, especially since you can take advantage of, of some of the tax benefits that are associated with investing in ETFs, where ETFs can rebalance uh, taxable gains. For example, uh, about uh, six weeks or so ago, the fund that I manage, we had somewhere around a four million dollars in gains and we traded out of a certain stock into a different allocation and we saved investors somewhere between one and a half to two million dollars in taxes on that because they were short-term gains but because of the way ETFs are structured if you set them up a certain way you could actually reallocate without paying taxes uh, uh, the ETF, you know, obviously assuming you have gains and stuff like that, talk to your CPA, right? I'm just trying to educate on how ETF structures work. So, uh, yeah, ETF structure, very, very interesting. NVIDIA, very, very interesting. And I would balance my enthusiasm for chips and AI, especially cloud with solar. My take. Anyway, thank you so very much for watching. Really appreciate you all. And we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.